It's time to examine options, calls and puts. A call does just that. It uh, calls, receives the security, and delivers cash in exchange. A put option delivers, puts the security, and receives cash in exchange. And there's a buyer and seller of each one of these done by third parties, not by the company itself. If it's done by the company itself, uh, then these are uh, warrants in the case of calls or, say, employee stock options, which are not usually tradable. And one might note that the buyer of a call has nominal similarities to a seller of a put and vice versa. A call option has value if uh, the underlying security rises. A put has value if the underlying security falls. Uh, the contract has a pre-specified price, the exercise price, also known as the strike price. So a call is the security price minus the exercise, provided it's positive. Otherwise, it's zero because with these options, you have the option to walk away from it. The same thing is true for a put, but the value is the exercise price minus the strike price, and again, only if it's positive. Let's start with a computational example, an exercise price, contract price of uh, 40. And in the uh, first column there at the bottom, we have a uh, security price of 42. And the call would be worth two points in that the security is worth two more than the exercise, meaning the contract itself allows you to buy the security at a $2 discount, so to speak, so that contract's worth $2. A uh, put would have no value because you could sell it in the market for 42 and uh, the put contract would have allowed you to do that for 40. That's unattractive. You can walk away from it, as is the case in options, so therefore the value is zero. But if the security were to fall to 37, the call becomes worthless and the put's worth three. Here's a graph for someone who buys a call. It only has intrinsic value if the stock rises above the exercise. And here's a graph of a seller of a call bearing a loss if the stock falls. And here's a graph of all four of them. And you notice we've added here a long position showing gains to the right, losses to the left, and likewise for a short position where there was a flip. Here's a simplified matrix notation of the same thing, where the top rows indicate what happens when a price of a security rises, and uh, the bottom row indicates what happens when the security price falls. And uh, we note that we can speculate with these or hedge with them to avoid risk. You would uh, buy a put to hedge a long position, and you would buy a call to hedge a short position. Because of the asymmetry of these options, you don't get them for free. Uh, the positive ones, buying a call or a put, you would pay premium. And uh, for uh, selling them, you would receive the premium. Whether hedging or speculating, and I'm going to argue later that we'll do neither, but do something far more interesting with options, you're facing the distribution of what turns out to be, in my own research as others, a random normal distribution. And on this graph, the green is uh, one standard deviation each way, uh, one third of the case on each side. And the uh, next red is 95% of the cases. So when uh, pricing the option, there is an excess premium above the uh, intrinsic value, whether it's in or out of the money. And uh, you, if you think about it, would not be too surprised to find that it tends to be greatest when the security is at the money, meaning close to the exercise price. And it becomes larger for more volatile securities and also becomes larger for the greater time to expiration, which is generally a function of the square root of time. And here's a graphic I made from a random simulation. And the ones closer to the center are uh, not surprisingly higher in terms of annualized returns. These present excess premiums divided by the time to expiration. And uh, notice they appear symmetric, which is unlikely in the real world, in that the calls reflect often a greater premium because stocks on average tend to rise. So before we go to a 
specific recommendation on how to take advantage of options and it's not to speculate nor to hedge. Uh, we note again the option has an intrinsic value which is positive because you can walk away from them. There is an excess premium above that and that excess premium is typically greater when the options at the money is more volatile, has a greater time to expiration. And uh, watch out for those puts. During times of ex-dividend distributions, those puts will seem to be larger than they should be. And of course, they have a certain present value discount component. So instead of buying puts or calls to either speculate or hedge, I recommend doing the reverse. First note that selling puts and calls, you always receive the premium. And if you wanted to buy a stock itself, well, how would you do that? You would sell a put. Remember, selling a put, you're ready to receive the security. And if you want to sell a long position, you would sell a call ready to give up the position. So let's walk through the various scenarios. Uh, you're ready to buy a security. You could have used a limit order. Uh, but instead you sell a put ready to buy the stock but in this case you get paid the premium as well uh, the stock does fall as it would be with a limit order you bought the stock and you receive the premium suppose it doesn't fall to your strike price like a limit price well you still keep the premium and on the Monday following the third Friday's expiration you can sell another one likewise for a call. You're ready to sell the stock, receive the premium, regardless of whether the stock is sold or not. There is, of course, the Black-Scholes options pricing model for call options and uh, the suggestions of what to look for in terms of uh, greater premiums really summarize what's in that model and is available as software. And as such, uh, I would be a tad leery, noting that the model is theoretic and has led many, including its creator, into some very sad circumstances. This has been Dr. C Invests.